Welcome everybody. As you know, you know my background, but I'll just give you a little bit of a brief as to how I started in this. Um, we, my husband and I moved into our first home in Warrandyte, a lovely place. It's um, quite a bushy area in Melbourne, for one of the first gold mining towns in Australia. And uh, the moment we moved in, we both developed insomnia. Now, I was a great sleeper prior to moving into this house and all of a sudden we started to not sleep very well, didn't even make the connection that the house could be connected. Within 12 months I fell pregnant, wasn't expecting that, always a bit of a shock when you're not planning it. And uh, of course you get your head around, we're going to have children and then at 11 weeks I miscarried. I subsequently had 10 miscarriages in this home and after seeking every therapist from the most esoteric, Prana Keeling was the most esoteric, to IVF, which we didn't qualify for because I got pregnant easily, um, and haematologists and immunologists, etc., we came to the conclusion that we couldn't have children. What was interesting, though, is my neighbour saying, oh, no one successfully had children in this house. And I thought that was interesting. Why haven't anyone had children? You know, the house was built in the 1960s. No one successfully had children in this house. And uh, I started to notice that we were sleeping on the other side of the wall of the metre panel and thought maybe that could be playing a role. In 2002, two landmark studies on miscarriages and exposure to AC magnetic fields came out and stated that anything above 15 milligauss is associated with an increase in miscarriages risk. So I went and got a gauss meter and measured it and it was over 300 milligauss a lot of the time. Um, it varied a lot depending on the current, at the amount of appliances on at any given time. But of course, in the middle of the night when your gas hot water service kicks in because of energy efficiency, you know, less power use, it spikes, you know, so in the middle of the night I'm doing this, my husband, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> look, oh my God, look, it's over 15 milligauss, 30 milligauss. Um, interesting connection. So I started to ask at that time my patients about their home. I thought, oh, okay, this is happening with me, with insomnia, what about them? Started to, it, actually the, the turning point for me was having two boys with respiratory tract infections who I was treating, five and seven year old brothers who had chronic respiratory tract infections since birth. They would average eight courses of antibiotics each every year since birth. And uh, the mother came to me and said, look, I'm at my wit's end. I don't want to give them the antibiotics because I know it's not good for them. Can you help me? So, of course, herbs, you know, to dry out the phlegm and supplements. And whilst they were on the diet, a low mucus forming diet, they improved about 50%. But as soon as they came off the diet and off the herbs, all the symptoms came back. So about eight weeks into the treatment, the mother said, look, I'm about to run out of herbs. I can't get to the clinic. Is there any way you can drop it off to my house? So I went to Malvern, this beautiful multi-million dollar home. And the moment I stepped foot in the door, I could smell mould. And I said, is there a mould problem in this house? She said, yeah, there is in the boys' room. Oh. So there we go in the boys' room and there's this black mould growing on the cornices. Not much, um, but it, was sm it smelled damp. And because it was a concrete slab as well, um, it was coming up also from the skirting boards, and uh, which meant that it was very difficult to treat. And I said to her, you know what, I think this is actually causing your symptoms. Um, I'd strongly suggest you move out. So I didn't know anything about mould at that time, but you know, looking at what was going on in the boys' room, they used to paint over it to fix the problem, which exposed the boys to VOCs, of course, um, and it didn't do anything for the problem. So they did. Six months later, they moved into a house across the road because they loved the street. And within three months, the boys' symptoms stopped. And 18 months later, they averaged one cold each in that 18 months. That was almost 20 years ago. And it changed. I walked out of that house as a completely different practitioner because it suddenly dawned on me that the environment could actually be playing a role. Now, when I studied acupuncture and naturopathy, we didn't do environmental health at all. So I started to look into the research, and one particular stat by the, Indoor Air, by the World Health Organization in 1984 stated that 80% of all lung disease is due to poor indoor air quality. I went, wait a minute, I've just spent $60,000 on a double degree. I don't remember learning about indoor air quality and respiratory tracts infection. So, you know, I was a bit annoyed. So I thought, as a naturopath, I was holistic. In fact, I was training first years and fourth years in naturopathic philosophy about how holistic they were. And yet now I'm discovering that an entire chunk of the pie of causes, causative illnesses, environmental health, has completely been missed. So looking back and starting to realise what on earth is going on that chronic fatigue is becoming my bread and butter. 
wait a minute, a few of them talked about mould. So I started to look into mould. I started to look into chemical sensitivity. I started to look into electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And what I discovered is the symptoms are almost identical. So if you match EHS, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, with biotoxin illness from um, cyanobacteria, for example, or mould, these are types of biotoxins, uh, with chemical sensitivities, they're almost the same. In fact, if someone is chemically sensitive, they are often electrically sensitive. If someone becomes electromagnetic <coughs> sensitivity, all of a sudden they can't have the newspaper anymore, depending on their degree of sensitivity, because they're reacting to the ink. Why? Because we're talking about the same illness. In medicine, we like to compartmentalise and diagnose in boxes, but the reality is the body doesn't work like that. The body has a very particular way of dealing with environmental chemicals and biotoxins, and it does it the same way regardless of the type of chemical, regardless of the type of biotoxin, and the outcome is the same. So we need to start getting away from looking at the individual diagnoses and starting to look at the pathology involved and more importantly always asking yourself what is causing this patient's condition and that's why the most important <coughs> questions you ask is how long have you lived in this home? How old is the house? The age of the house tells us so many things about potential causes. Older homes of course what are you going to have as issues in older homes? Lead, paint, yep. Asbestos, definitely. Lead in the water supply if they've got gallop pipe, etc. Yep, copper can be an issue too. Yes, your synthetic mineral fibres, etc. Uh, in your newer homes, you're going to have all your VOCs outgassing, aren't you? You're going to potentially have condensation issues depending on how tight the building is because you know there's no passive ventilation. So you already get some triggers based on the age of the house as to what potential factors could occur. Questions like. Do your symptoms improve when you're away from the house? Yeah. When I go on holidays, I'm better. And everyone in at my industry used to go, oh, yeah, that's because you're, you're away from the stress of work. But in fact, maybe it could be because they're away from the cause in their home. And these are the sort of things that we need to nut out. In the last 15 years, there has been a remarkable man who has looked at biotoxin illness and mould. And his name's Dr. Richie Shoemaker. And he's treated over 10,000 patients with mold illness. And it started with the Fisteria outbreak along the north coast of America, where blue-green algae took over their lakes and killed all the fish. And these, it produced microtoxins into their water supply. And these communities that would depend on this water supply got very, very sick with chronic fatigue-like symptoms. So he was he, trying to figure out why they were sick and did a huge amount of pathology tests to find out what was going on. And, based on all the typical pathology tests that are conducted by GPs, nothing was coming up. So it was assumed that it was psychosocial, psychosomatic. He started to look at inflammation in the inflammatory markers and suddenly he found something that was very unique. That in fact the way these people were reacting, that 24% of the population do not create antibodies to mould. What does that mean? When you go into a water damaged building, that's what we'd refer to as a mould affected building, a water damaged building, you have um, moisture and the moisture is what's creating the problem, isn't it? Because we have spores, mould spores everywhere from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Fungi are nature's greatest decomposers. They are at the top of the kingdom of the ability to adapt to the environment. We can have a nuclear bomb, fungi are going to survive. No matter what happens, we'll go, they will still be there. They've adapted, their capacity to adapt to the environment is so remarkable, it is incredible. So mould spores are everywhere. The issue is, where is their food? Well, it's most of our building materials. So the key always to mould is always going to be, where is the moisture? And as soon as you have moisture sitting there for more than 48 hours, guess what? It's going to grow because it's just ready to go right now. Why? Because it wants to decompose things because that's what Earth does. That's what nature does. That's what's meant to happen in our cycle. So what happens is that when you go into a water damaged building, if you are healthy and you're not, the, and you're the 76% of clients who produce antibodies, you go into the building, your immune system goes, oh, I don't recognise that, you're inhaling some antigens that are foreign, quick, let's uh, take it to the, to the lymph nodes and let's get some uh, recognition of these antigens and then produce antibodies. So next time you walk into that building, it's going to mount an immune response that's going to kill off these antigens before you even know anything's going on. So what happens to you? Nothing. You don't notice anything, but this is what's going on in your immune response. 
24% of people, when they walk back into that water damaged building, it sets up inflammation because it's our first line of defence. Our first line of defence by the body is to set up an inflammatory response. To go, yep, inflammation, let's deal with it, and let's get the um, humoral immunity involved, antibodies. This doesn't happen with them. So it sets up an inflammation in the body that never switches off. So when you have inflammation in the periphery and in the limbs, basically you restrict blood flow because the inflammation attracts white blood cells and different types of um, immune cells, which restricts oxygen flow, which means the lactic acid builds up in the, in the limbs. Um, and it also causes poor circulation. So they get this unusual poor circulation in the periphery and a lot of unusual pain because the oxygen isn't getting there, the lactic acid is building up, etc. So we often see this as fibromyalgia in clinic. So these unusual pains. The inflammation also attacks three really important neuropeptides in the brain. And these peptides, one of them particularly is involved in sleep. One of the most common symptoms of inflammatory illness that people first develop is fatigue and sleep disturbances. It doesn't matter how much sleep they get, they're always never rested and their sleep is disturbed. And you find this with all the chronic inflammatory illnesses, with electromagnetic hypersensitivity, with mold related illnesses and chemical sensitivities. So it knocks out these melanocyte stimulating hormones, which in turn affects melatonin. So when, what happens is this inflammation then puts a huge burden on melatonin. Is everyone familiar with melatonin? It's a remarkable neuropeptide that's the probably incredible antioxidant that helps to prevent cancer cells in the body. It's secreted at night time by the pineal gland and basically it mops up and scavenges all the free radicals in the body and helps reduce your risk of cancer, etc. It's probably the most important antioxidant that far supersedes any vitamin or mineral on the market. That's the one that gets knocked out with inflammation. So once we shut down melatonin's capacity to reduce um, all of these free radicals, we open up ourselves to chronic inflammation in the body and all the symptoms you will see with those mold, electromagnetic sensitivity and chemical sensitivity start taking over. And these people get sick and of course because the inflammatory markers aren't being tested, no one knows what's going on and it ends up being, oh, it's in your head. So from that avenue, it's very exciting and in the mould subject we're going to look at the biochemistry involved from the time people are exposed to biotoxins, which inflammatory markers and immune cells are involved, how it knocks out these really important neuropeptides and why these people get odd symptoms. Many of them have excessive urination and excessive thirst, like diabetes, but they're not diabetic. Many of them get easy to shock, so they touch things and they get electric shocks all the time because it knocks out antidiuretic hormone, which is an important hormone that regulates your fluid metabolism in the body. Many of the, many of the patients I dealt with, especially females who have these symptoms, who are diagnosed with chronic fatigue, always say to me, when I'm pregnant, my symptoms disappear. That's a really interesting observation. Why do the symptoms disappear? And the reason why is because the neuropeptide involved with sleep and inflammation and pain increases significantly with pregnancy. Melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is the, one of the key neuropeptides involved in inflammation, increases with pregnancy. So suddenly they start sleeping better. Suddenly they don't have all of these unusual pains and inflammation in their periphery. So I think that's an interesting one. If you have a look and start looking at what the clients are telling you and matching it with their symptoms, you suddenly have a good understanding that we are dealing with inflammation in the body. So the most important thing you do as a building biologist is find out what is causing that inflammation. And when it comes to things like mould or chemical sensitivity or electromagnetic sensitivity, you have to address all of it. That's why I say when people might come into the course and say, I just want to do the certificate electromagnetic field testing, I'll go, well, if all you've got is a hammer, all you're going to see is a nail. So you're going to look for electromagnetic fields and go in there and go, it's not EMFs. But in fact, mould can cause exactly the same symptoms. Many times clients are going to go, especially in Victoria, oh, my smart meter caused my symptoms. More than 50% of the time, it's not such, it's not the problem. It's something else. It's the cordless phone is creating far more radio frequencies than their smart meter because they're actually literally next to it. You cannot separate electromagnetic hypersensitivity from mold or chemical sensitivity. 
if they, are, if they have one, you have to go through all the chemicals in their environment. You have to look at all the electromagnetic fields. You have to look at and exclude mould and biotoxins as an issue because they all cause the same related illnesses. So I'm sure RAF will give you some case studies too. People go, you know, I've got electromagnetic fields is an issue. Can you come and do testing? You go, then you go, it's not EMFs, it's mould. And the worst part about mould, which scares me the most about this particular uh, toxin, is probably my top list of adverse health effects, is that the worst homes I've ever been in, I couldn't smell mould, I couldn't see it. And I've gone in there and taken air samples, I've done moisture mapping and then realised, actually there's a bit of moisture here that I can't pick up or touch, but my moisture meter's going, yeah, there's definitely an issue here. There's a history of flooding and drainage issues and the symptoms occurred around that time. So there's all these big ticks going, could be mould, I can't see it, I can't smell it, I can't see any issues. When the lab results come back from the lab, I go, I wish I had not gone in there without my respirator. And they've literally walked out with their clothes on their back not to return for up to 12 months while the house is remediated. More importantly, their symptoms have improved in that time. We're starting to have some really good tests that are available for building biologists that are really important to use. And one of them that you should know about now is the visual contrast sensitivity test, vcs.com. It's an important one to know because I, I want you all to take this test because if you come up positive on this, that would be a real positive problem in so far as your ability to do mould as a job. Visual contrast sensitivity is a test that was used a lot in the Air Force. But what we found that it's so good for is that it, it picks up inflammation on the optic nerve. And what we do find is that inflammatory illnesses, inflammation on the optic nerve can reflect inflammation in the brain. What I love about this test Number one, it's free. They do ask for a donation, two bucks or whatever. You don't have to. People who are affected by mould, before I go to their house, regardless of what they... Nowadays, I don't tend to ask what type of audit they want because they don't know what they don't know. They think it's this, but they don't have the expertise you do. So I bring everything with me nowadays because many times I've gone in and going, it's not EMFs, I should have brought my mould equipment. Bring everything. The beauty about this is... If they come up positive on this visual contrast sensitivity, it's a good indication that there's inflammation in the brain and it's likely to be due to biotoxins. It was specifically for biotoxins and mould, but it could be due to other things as well. These, this helps us determine this, if the inflammation is there. When I've had patients with chronic fatigue due to mould walk out of their building within three weeks of being out of a water damaged building, this comes up <coughs> negative. So I find this is a fantastic test to see how they're improving. Within weeks of moving back into a water damaged building, often within a week, they'll come up positive again. So this is a brilliant test that I get all my clients to, to do and email me the results. It takes seven minutes to do. And basically you're looking at contrast of grey lines. And it's done in a way that you're looking at whether the lines are going to the left, to the right or straight up and down and you just click A, B or C. Eventually they get so faded, you go, I can't see anything, that's normal. How you respond to the different types of, of the testing tells us which the, the degree of the inflammation, but it's brilliant. So this tells me a lot of the clients I've dealt with who thought they were EHS, who've done this, I've gone, this, it's likely mould is a problem. They go, oh, yeah, I, I did have a mould problem, but I thought they were EHS. Why? Because the symptoms are almost the same. So this is a really important test to do. Just on that, does it factor in age in terms of, like, is there any kind of pre-qualification or that kind of thing where you go to look at it? Yes. Um, there's a couple of criteria. First, you need to wear glasses if you normally wear glasses. Yeah. It's not testing the same sort of... You don't normally get this test from an optometrist. Um, it's, it's different to the types of acuity tests you would get from an optometrist. In terms of AGS, yes, you'd need to, there are some eye diseases that make it not valid for you to do the test, but it will state that on this. There's a whole piece of information at the beginning of this test. If you've got access to a computer, it would be good for you to do that tonight. As I said, it takes about seven minutes, um, but it's a great one to do. And particularly, I find when clients are improving, this is a very useful test to do on an ongoing basis. Will that um, the screen resolution 
would be a kind of change of the test if you have a very bad screen or bad colours? It'd be more, a more, not so much the screen because they're pretty uniform nowadays. It'd be more to make sure you get sufficient lighting. It will state at the beginning what sort of distance you need to be from the screen. If you wear glasses, wear them for reading, yep, for short sightedness. Um, so it'll indicate what you need to do before you conduct the test. Yep. But the fact that it's free, it's pretty accurate, um, it's brilliant. And it's a wonderful tool as a building biologist. Before you go to the occupant's house, because it gives you an idea, hmm, maybe I need to, you know, to check for mould as well. Regardless, once they have CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, or multiple chemical sensitivity, or mould illness, you have to look at all of those parameters. Because inflammation can be caused by chemicals, um, it can be caused by biotoxins, and it can be caused by mould. So you cannot separate those illnesses. As technology advances, there is more and more really good stuff to play with. Like, you know, women, we're not into jewellery, we're into equipment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're not normal. Unfortunately, my equipment is like $3,500. But this is the indoor air quality egg developed by a group of um, American and Dutch researchers, I think it's about $100, $120, and it measures carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, remarkable. And basically what you do is you plug it in um, into your home and then you hook up to their website and then you can see who the other hundreds of thousands of eggs all over the world, what their monitoring status is. So it's like a big global network of people monitoring uh, air quality through the indoor air quality egg. So there's more and more of this technology coming out. Not very useful for your client's perspective, but for you, it's a great one to check your monitoring. If you're living near major arterial routes, for example, um, to check for you know, noxious gases like nitrogen dioxide, etc. So it's a, it's a really useful tool that can be used. You'd have to leave it there at the client's house for a good week. In fact, most people leave it there for months, and then they can look on the internet um, what all of those parameters are doing at your house. And you can look at whoever else is in your suburb that's got an indoor air quality egg, etc. So it's um, a very useful tool. It's a bit hard to set up um, initially. So you want someone a little bit with IT knowledge, but um, it's a very useful tool to have. Most of the equipment we're going to teach you within the subject, we say don't buy. Because if you're if you're having to go to in a court of law, which RAF has done many times, um, you need something that's calibrated and you want something from a air sampling company so you know, your equipment is, is up to date. So we'll go through what you should buy and what you don't buy and what you sample. And it's normal with the work that we do that, thank you, yep. It's normal with the work that we do that you charge per hour and then you have a um, high fee for the equipment. So I'll pass this around so you can have a look at the the egg. Okay, now what I wanted to do is to start with um, the 10 toxic truths. I'm currently studying my masters as you know um, with Professor Mark Cohen who's got a couple of PhDs because obviously he was bored with himself and he's a doctor as well so he's come up with the 10 toxic truths and I think it's a really good place to start in so far as determining the extent to which environmental health is having an impact on human health. In fact he's got is, is everyone familiar with the Good Doctors podcast? No? You've got to get on to write it down. Good Doctors. The Good Doctors. Just Google that. The Good Doctors. Um, Ron Ehrlich, who's a holistic dentist, and Michelle Woolhouse, who's an integrative GP, run The Good Doctors. Have you listened to it at all, Dill? It's really good background when you're studying, you know, um, doing your homework. Have it on the internet. It's a podcast, basically. And they're normally half hour episodes of huge range of different experts from environmental health to nutrition to authors etc a really good podcast to listen to so I know they've interviewed um, Professor Mark Cohen a couple of times now in terms of the 10 toxic truths and I think when you hear it from a professor the it's quite daunting the gravity of what we're actually dealing with and finally it was nice to finally bump into another presenter who's actually talking the same language that I'm talking at and what you guys will be talking about as well. So, in the first toxic, the first of the ten toxic truths, toxins are everywhere and everyone is affected. We're all affected. Persistent organic pollutants are persistent and take a long time to break down. 
So basically we are all affected. Now I want you to think about that. The air you now breathe, 17,000 litres a day goes through an average adult lung. The water you, and drinks you now consume, where does it come from? It comes from our environment, our food. Within a matter of a short period of about seven years, all of the atoms in your body are going to be replaced by the air you now breathe, by the water you now drink, and by the food you eat. So within seven years, the atoms in the environment are going to become part of your makeup, aren't they? Except your bones, it takes a bit longer. That is how intimately connected we are to the environment. When we poison the environment, we poison ourselves because we are all affected, because we are all connected. So when we spray DDT in South America, which we continue to do for malaria, of course, um, it gets in through the global distillation and it travels everywhere. This is why they find detectable levels of DDT in polar bears, even though it was sprayed 15,000 kilometres away. In fact, the Inuits in the Arctic are probably have one of the most con contaminated uh, bodies, even though they're the furthest away from industrialisation because of the global distillation of winds. So we are all affected and we are all connected. And this is why we need to address farming principles on a worldwide scale, not just as individual countries. Second to to toxic truth, the full extent is not known. Man, we have no idea. Why? Because the burden of proof is on the public and the researchers to prove harm. The burden of proof is on the government to prove harm, that those chemicals are toxic. Because the manufacturers can do whatever they want to introduce them into their products, they don't have to prove safety. Okay? So, how do I know this? Well, we, as you know, manufacture our own cleaning product range. We can put pretty much whatever we want in there. We don't have to prove that it's safe. The government has to prove that it's dangerous before we would have to act as manufacturers to do anything about it. And how long do you think that takes? Generations. Generations. Let's have a look at endocrine disrupting chemicals. In the 1960s, up until the 1960s in medicine, it was assumed that the human, and particularly the mother, would protect the fetus from um, chemicals that the placenta would not allow those chemicals to pass through. And of course then thalidomide happened. The mother had thalidomide as a drug and basically, I think it was for morning sickness, wasn't it? Thalidomide, yep. And then children were born without limbs. Wow, how can a mother have a drug and have no effect, no side effects at all? And yet the child has dramatic impacts. And of course this was another toxic truth that Chemicals at critical windows of development can cause severe effects in a fetus. So what might not affect an adult can have massive ramifications for an unborn fetus. That when you're exposed to a chemical at a critical window of development, i.e. when they're having surges of, of hormones, that can have massive consequences on the outcome on that particular person. And of course children are the most vulnerable when it comes to this. So Rachel Carson was one of the first. Has everyone uh, read Rachel Carson? If you haven't, you need to read it. It's really sort of the landmark of the beginning of building biology. Rachel Carson, the famous book was Silent Spring. She died of cancer, probably related to the chemicals she was talking about. And she spoke a lot about the impact on top predators of pesticide exposure, particularly the bald eagle, which was the American symbol at the time. Um, and the fact that the eggshells were thinning and cracking and the, d the young were dying and weren't able to survive. And she's saying the pesticides are causing this massive impact on wildlife. And the amount of crap she got from chemical industry and the farming community because she was threatening their industry and saying, look, this is causing adverse health effects in wildlife. Um, as a result of her work, the US EPA developed, in fact, the Environmental Protection Agency because she was able to show them that it was causing cancer and infertility and all of these things in top predators in, in wildlife, eventually the EPA was developed. In fact, the Democrats party actually developed as a result of her work on the environmental health. Then of course thalidomide happened. At the same time, DES diethylstilbestrol. Is everyone familiar with DES? DES is a drug that was given for women to prevent miscarriages. and uh, In fact, it was given to women with normal um, pregnancies to give them a bigger and better baby. What woman wants a bigger baby coming out of there? I don't know. But of course in the 50s, 
that's what you did, you know? You were at home and you smiled at your husband and la la la. And we were all on Ford pills. Um, yeah, so DES was given to over 5 million women and it had no effect on the woman. But when her daughter reached puberty and beyond, she had a, a significant increased risk of an unusual form of vaginal cancer. And if she didn't get that, then her incidence of breast cancer tripled by the time she got into her 30s and 40s. What we're seeing is that certain chemicals at critical windows of development have massive consequences on children and an unborn fetus. And the problem with that is that in toxicology, the way we assess chemicals currently in industrialised countries is based on the dose. The higher the level of exposure, the greater the in impact on the human body. And it comes to a threshold. So therefore we have exposure standards to say, if you're exposed at this level, you should not get side effects. But if you're exposed above that level, you will. When it comes to <coughs> hormone disrupting chemicals, that doesn't work. Because the lower the level of exposure, the worse the outcome. And the reason is because our remarkable bodies have hormones. And hormones work at very, very, very low levels. So just to give you an idea if you're into gin and tonic, think of 99 train carts of tonic, right? We're talking maybe up to 100 kilometres long, a train, up to 100 kilometres long with 99 carts of tonic. One drop of gin in all of those 99 carts is sufficient to have an impact hormonally on the body because it works in parts per trillion. So the lower the level of exposure that a child or an unborn fetus is exposed to hormone disrupting chemicals, the worse the outcome. So if we're going to bring BPA into the environment, we need to do it at much, much higher levels. We need to load all our food tins in much higher levels because we're less likely to have an impact on an unborn fetus if it's loaded with those BPA levels in terms of their critical windows of development. Now, I'm not recommending that, of course, because that would be a disaster. But BPA is one of almost a thousand hormone disrupting chemicals that are now in everyday use. And the BPA free plastics that are now used are showing to be worse than BPA. Because the bisphenol family is like three generations of Italian. We've got A, D, we've got F and S. I mean, wow. Why? Because the burden of proof is not on the manufacturer to prove safety. So they go, wow, we want money dividends for shareholders. So what we're going to do is, no one wants BPA, so let's put in BPS instead. And we can market it as BPA free. So it's BPA free, isn't it? But there's bisphenol less in there. That's probably the most common bisphenol that they now use in BPA free plastics. B BPS is showing to be much stronger in hormone adverse effects in rodents than even BPA was. BPA was actually used in the 1940s and 30s initially for oral contraceptive pill because of its estrogenic effect. So while we started loading our tins in it, our cash receipts, um, you know, our polycarbonate plastics is, you know, I don't know. The Japanese, of course, phased out BPA lining their tins in 1998. In Australia, it's in most of our tins. So the problem here is, is that when you regulate chemicals, it, when it comes to the dose, that is completely irrelevant for endocrine disrupting chemicals because the lower the level of exposure in an unborn fetus, the worse the outcome. And when do you see those outcomes? You see them when the child, um, it, as a young child growing in, going through its milestones, when it hits puberty, fertility. In fact, it's so diverse, the impact of these chemicals on children, we now know that there's been a, a pandemic of neurobehavioural disorders in children. Just to give you some stats, in the 1970s, the incidence of autism was four children in every 10,000 children. Now it's one in 68 in the US, and in Australia they're estimating at about one in 100. And that was from f statistics four years ago, so it's probably more now. There has been an explosion. Of course, people would argue, oh, there's better diagnosis. Better diagnosis alone cannot account for that increased in explosion. And genetics can't account for that either because it's happened so rapidly in the last 30 years. Coincidentally, in the last 30 years, what has happened is that there's been an explosion of neurodevelopmental chemicals that have impacted the built environment. Grandjean and um, Philip Landrigan uh, had a systematic review that they published in 2013 on neurodevelopmental chemicals and um, developmental disorders in children 
And wow, I look at this list of heavy metals, lead, mercury, um, flame retardants, um, solvents in cleaning products, etc., uh, pesticides, and I go, they're in the house. They're all in the house. Most of them are sitting in the dust. They're coming from that Chinese furniture from Freedom. Um, they're coming from our personal care products. They're in our now mercury light box, compact fluorescent light bulbs because it's green. So now we've got mercury vapour sitting in all of our light bulbs that if you break, that's what a disaster that is. Um, it's in our homes. Nine out of the 11 chemicals they've flagged as neurodevelopmental toxins are actually in our house. And they're in, primarily in our dust. And guess what? Who's closest to the ground exposed to it at critical windows of development? Our children. So how we deal with dust in our home as building biologists is so important that you can't spend enough time going through that when you're doing an audit because this is where most of the contaminants are happening apart from what you bring into the house with your fly sprays and with the household pr products and chemicals and you know <coughs> your perfumes etc. But endocrine disruption chemicals are an enigma. The World Health Organization recently has dated a report in 2012 on hormone disrupting chemicals and they basically said we're stuffed. <laughs> like how do you regulate these chemicals if the lower the level of exposure results in worse outcomes? The only way to regulate them is zero tolerance and the only way you're going to get zero tolerance is if you classify them as class one or group one carcinogens. The only chemicals that are actually have zero tolerance are those that are known carcinogens. The effects are epigenetic and transgenerational. They affect two generations. So autism and things like that now, you have to go back to the grandparents. What happened in the 60s and 70s? An explosion of pesticides and market gardening in Australia. DDT, organochlorines. That's when the, those parents were ex exposed. And if they were pregnant, we're seeing the outcome of that in their children and now their children's children. Because as I said, by week 14, the reproductive organs of that fetus have been formed. And remember with girls, all the eggs you're ever going to have were there. So your eggs were already exposed through the chemicals coming through the placenta. And let's face it, unfortunately, most of the environmental chemicals we're talking about are lipophilic. They love fat. So they get through the placenta pretty easy. And because of this, most chemicals, environmental chemicals, are lipophilic, which means they love fat. They go where the fat goes. And what do you think is the most fattiest thing you excrete as a woman? Milk. Breast milk. The World Health Organization stated three years ago, the most effective way to determine environmental toxicity is to assess a woman's breast milk because it will be the most toxic. And can you imagine an environment where we say to women, don't breastfeed? I'm not advocating that, but I'm just letting you know that the World Health Organization says that's the best biomarker. Why? Because it's 99% fat. And what likes fat? Environmental chemicals because they are lipophilic. They love fat. So lipo as in fat, philic as in like. <coughs> Think about it. What does your liver do? The body has a remarkable capacity to deal with chemical, natural chemicals and biotoxins, etc. Unfortunately, a lot of the environmental chemicals are lipophilic, and that's a problem. When it comes to lipophilic chemicals, what happens is the body, the liver, converts it into what? Not lipophilic, they convert it into a... What does that mean? Water soluble, water loving. The whole function of liver detoxification, I used to teach liver detoxification over a semester. Man, that was boring. <laughs> ACE 2 ACE, la la la, cytochrome P450 enzymes. In a nutshell, detoxification transforms chemicals from a lipophilic state. Why? Because if it's lipophilic, it wants to stay in your body where the fat is, yeah? It converts, the liver converts through all the enzymatic actions and the different phase reactions in the liver in chemicals from a lipophilic state to a hydrophilic state. It makes them water soluble because if it makes it water soluble, how is it going to come out? Urine? Sweat. That's why sweat is an important part of a low detox process. Sweating every day, exercising is an important way to detox. This is how you eliminate your toxins. 
So urine and sweat is an important, even exhalation through your vapour, um, you will exhale. So the function of liver detoxification is to convert lipophilic or fat-loving chemicals to hydrophilic so it doesn't want to stay in the body. Unfortunately, many of the environmental chemicals in the process of doing that creates metabolites that are far more toxic than the original chemical. Great example is DDT. DDT, toxic, but when you get it through the liver in the first phase reaction, it creates DDE, which is very toxic, more toxic to the body than DDT was. So in the process of doing this, this is where we create massive amounts of free radicals. And what deals with the free radicals? Melatonin. Wow. Melatonin is needed for sleep. What happens when you flood the body with huge amount of free radicals that melatonin can no longer scavenge? You end up with sleep disturbances, inflammation, inability to detox chemicals. So what does the body do? It shunts it into the fat. There is a hypothesis that the epidemic of obesity could be due to environmental chemicals, that the body shunts it to the fat tissues to get it away from vital organs. That is a very interesting hypothesis. But it's something that, you know, you, it, you, when people talk about, when you're taking the interview and the questionnaire and the more it, with the client, you need to look at that in terms of their weight, whether they've had dramatic increases in weight, no changes in diet, stress, etc., that are unexplained. And this is something that I think will come out more in the literature, that there are chemicals that make people overweight, particularly children, you know. I mean, infant obesity in infants who have never even eaten food has increased by 70% in the last 20 years. How can infant obesity increase if they've never even had food go through their lips? They're just having infant formula or breast milk. And this is why they're thinking environmental chemicals could be a big role because Vom Saal's research, Frederick Vom Saal, was the first to look at BPA. He's the father of sort of BPA. And because he worked with rats and he saw, and rats live short lives, he was able to see within, quickly within certain generations of rats, the second and third generations, obesity in the rats. And he thought this can't be right, so he did it again and again and experimented on thousands of, of mice and sure enough, this is what was going on. We have obese lab rats. And that's another thing in science. You know, if you're using a certain type of, I think they call it the Wister rat, that they, they use to test lots of things on, these, these rats are becoming obese. And they think this might be the chemicals in their cages that they're exposed to that could be making them obese. So how can you make conclusions in science when you're using obese rats to start with? You know what I mean? This is a problem. And there's all of these other issues that come up with that. But this is the extent of what we're talking about. As building biologists, it crosses all of, the, um, syst all of the vital organs in the body. It's not just respiratory. Like when I first got into it, I thought, well, mole causes lung problems. That makes sense. You inhale it, of course. Well, actually, we now realise it can cause a systemic inflammation and chronic fatigue syndrome. That now what people are, are consuming uh, in their environment could actually make them gluten intolerant. This is very interesting, something very few practitioners know, that when people have chronic fatigue syndrome, especially the 24% that can't create antibodies to mould, so they cause inflammation every time they get into a water damaged building, some of these clients will produce antibodies to gliadin, which is a protein in gluten. So they become gluten intolerant. So the naturopath takes gluten out of the, the diet, but in fact the diet wasn't the problem. It's the inflammation in their body that's creating these unusual antibodies that are reacting to foods in their diet. And lo and behold, if you get rid of the inflammation and the cause, which could have been the mold or the EMFs, etc., suddenly they tolerate gluten in small amounts. So these are the sort of things we need to start educating people about because the evidence is emerging about this. And of course, then the whole microbiome, which is an extra organ in the body, you know, all the bacteria, etc. A lot of the work now done on mold. I suspect is actually the bacteria um, and less the mould that's causing the problem. Because whenever you have water somewhere, it's not just fungi that are proliferating, it's the bacteria. Because the immune system reacts to bacteria far more than it reacts to fungi. So in fact, what we refer to in a water damaged building is this chemical stew of biologicals. Because we've got bacteria, they produce endotoxins. We've got fungi, they produce mycotoxins. It's the bacterial, it's the chemical stew of all of these 
microbes and their byproducts that are causing the inflammation in the body. And in fact, if you look at the research, it's probably the bacteria in conjunction with the fungi that's actually causing this inflammatory response. Because when you look at inflammation in the body, the, the way the body reacts to antigens and microbes is it particularly reacts to bacteria. And you can't separate the bacteria from the fungi in a water damaged building. So very interesting research. Um, it gives hope to people who are sick who've been fobbed off as psychosomatic. I mean, you know, it's tragic when you go into people's homes and this is, explains why he, you know, the husband's not sick, but she's absolutely bedridden. 24%. She, her genotype is such that she has this HLA-DR genotype that means she cannot produce antibodies. Recently, I did an order of a, of a client's house. She was so sick. She, but they noticed because they travel a lot overseas, every time they went overseas, she improved significantly. Every time she went back home into a house in Blackburn, she got really sick. And lo and behold, she started thinking, the house is making me sick. But he, her husband has no symptoms. And he smokes and, you know, he seems to be fine. Different genotypes. So I went in there and you can see from the look of his face, he thinks his wife's probably a bit neurotic. So, and I can't see or smell mould and I'm thinking, maybe she's neurotic. I mean, you know, not that I'm a psychiatrist. Um, did the moisture mapping going, oh yeah, there's a bit of moisture going on here. Let's get some air samples and then go, oh my God, I can't believe that was in the air. Why the hell didn't I suit up with a full P3 respirator? No one should be in that building, but he doesn't get sick. Why? Because he's not the 24% of the population who sets up inflammation in his body. So they had to hire, rent a house in the same suburb for eight months while that house got remediated. And when you pulled the walls, some of those walls down in the, in the ceiling, it was riddled with mould, riddled, that you couldn't smell or see. So this is why it's important to A, have PPE, which I'm going to go into detail with, even though we're not doing mould yet, not in this subject anyway, um, because you don't know what you don't know. This is why the VCS test is so important because if they're coming up positive then I'm going, oh my God, is there, if they've got mould in the house that I won't be able to see. For my protection too. The more you walk into spaces that are mould, the more sensitive you can become. So this is really important that you get a handle on, you know, low chemical load, low EMF load with your work because you're walking into it all the time. Um, and this is why I want you to test it because if you're coming up positive on that then I'd say don't go into any mould damaged buildings until you address it and get to see GP who can treat you, which of course there's only two at the moment, but that's about to change soon. So maybe a lot of the, what we're seeing could be the explosion of antigens and bacteria and fungi in the, in the intestines that is changing the flora. And of course, if they don't have enough fibre in their diet, what happens is it gets passed back into the body and it starts all over there again, the inflammation. One of the most important drugs they use now for mold illness is a cholesterol lowering drug. Why? Because when you, in, when you ingest that, as the bile is getting secreted into, with all those microtoxins and bacteria into the bowel, the cholesterol lowering drug is binding to it and excreting it out through the faeces. And its impact on these patients is dramatic improvement. Otherwise, if they don't have sufficient fibre, etc., the drug they use is cholestyramine that they're using in the States. What it does is it gets reabsorbed and sets up the whole inflammation process again. Now, on top of that, what do we do as building biologists that, that we know can affect the flora in the gut? What do people do and consume that directly affects what's going on in their bowel? Antibiotics. Antibiotics, yeah, but in the house that they're ingesting that's affecting their flora. That is a huge problem, triclosan and antibacterial uses definitely because now we're starting to think that allergies is due to a lack of exposure to a variety of bacteria. This is new theories that are coming out about allergies that up until the age of two, the more bacteria a child is exposed to, the less the degree of allergies. That in fact having a dog in the first two years of life, because a dog has its own microbiome, microbiota, um, actually challenges that child's immune response. That in fact using cleaning products in a house is a bad idea, especially toxic cleaning products, because it kills bacteria and therefore reduces the amount of bacteria a child is exposed to to stimulate their immune response. <laughs> that the more bacteria, natural bacteria we're exposed to in the house, in our food, 
breast milk, vaginal birth. You know, when you're born naturally, you're exposed to your first lot of bacteria which colonise your gut, that your breast milk also provides some protection. So knowing whether someone has been born naturally, has breast milk, the type of foods they were given, from a building biology perspective, it is if you use chemicals that we know kill bacteria like your triclosans, that is not good because you reduce the amount of bacteria diversity that a child will be exposed to, which is required to stimulate their immune response. So the one I was getting to was chlorine in water. So chlorine in water, what does chlorine do in our water supply? It disinfects it, it kills bacteria, that's what it does. It gets rid of all the waterborne uh, diseases and the cholera and etc. That, we, that you know, we had from prior to the industrialisation of our country. However, it kills bacteria. So when you consume chlorinated water, the ramifications on the probiotics within the gut, wow, you know, I thought it was ironic that we would be giving them a $40 fantastic probiotic supplement and ingest it with chlorinated water. I mean, that's dumb, isn't it, really? But that's what we do. That's what naturopaths do. Why? Because they don't learn about drinking water. It's crazy, really. So these are the sort of things you'll pick up as you walk around space with the client to educate them about how they can improve their health. And each of those things can have dramatic impact on the long-term uh, health of that client in terms of the incidence of increasing the risk of cancers or neurodevelopmental disorders, etc. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to educate practitioners, um, pregnant women of all reproductive age, men of reproductive age, to reduce the incidences of a lot of the chronic illnesses we're seeing. So it's not just respiratory. Skin is a big one too. Again, chlorinated water, a disaster, very strong skin and lung irritant. So if all you do is get your client to recommend a Cadia filter, that will do wonders to reducing their load of chemicals and um, you know the trihalomethanes that occur with chlorinated water. Fluoride is the, one of the neurodevelopmental chemicals that was flagged by Landrigan and Grangian as a serious uh, developmental toxin for children. So fluoride is definitely a big no. The fact that it accumulates in up to 20,000 parts per million in the pineal gland where melatonin is secreted is a disaster. So fluoride, melatonin, neurodevelopmental disorders, wow. You know, there's a reason why Margaret Thatcher put it in the water supply, because it accumulates in the pineal gland and it makes people less aggressive. The Germans did it in World War II. You know, fluoride is used in rat poison. I mean, wow. And it's not just fluoride, it's all the contaminants and arsenic and lead that is also in the fluoride because it comes as a byproduct from the phosphate fertiliser industry. So this is a huge problem. 97% of Europe doesn't fluoridate its water supply. 97%. You don't see tooth decay rates going on there. No. In fact, four countries fluoridate their water supply. Four. That is it. Air sampling, as you'll see here on page three, <coughs> is complicated. We're talking about the synergistic effect of chemicals. Think about how chemicals are regulated. The way we do it now is we get one chemical on a group of rats, we give them enough to kill 50% of them, LD50, and then we know how many milligrams per kilogram of, of that chemical per kilogram of rat is required to kill it and we observe the side effects, the acute effects. Very rarely do we keep the ones that survive to look at chronic effects because we're the guinea pigs there. Chronic effects in terms of research, not often looked at. The way we see chronic effects of chemicals is we look at human epidemiological studies, which is disease in the human population, which is really, if you think about it, a bit ridiculous because we have to wait until the illness occurs in the population before we look back retrospectively to go, what the hell happened and what caused it? So chemicals are assessed. You get one chemical, one group of rats, look at it. I can tell you by the time you walked out of home this morning, you were exposed to at least 200 chemicals. Not you guys, because you're my building biologist. <laughs> but the conventional person, if they had hairspray, makeup, what did they wash their clothes in? Um, what about the chemicals through their drinking water and their showering? You know, it'd be very easy. We are exposed to chemical mixtures. We aren't exposed to one. And what we know is that the synergistic effect of chemicals can be multiple. What we now know, and in fact there's an interesting book that has come out recently on toxicology. It's firstly questioned the whole dose principle, especially with hormone disrupting chemicals, but it's also looking at synergistic effect. 
because many chemicals in, in the pharmaceutical industry with drugs, many drugs are hydrophilic. So if they're hydrophilic, are they going to want to stay in the body? No. So they add chemicals as penetrating enhancers with the pharmaceutical drugs to make them want to stay in the body. Vaccines is a good example. Often with vaccines, it's not the antigen or the bacteria or the attenuated bacteria that's the problem. It's the adjuvants and excipients they add to the vaccine to drive it into the system. That becomes the issue. So that can be a real problem and it's the synergistic effect. So when you have chemicals, the reality is with shampoos, conditioners and things like that, you have uh, both chemicals that are lipophilic, that love fat, and chemicals that are hydrophilic. And what they're now realising is that the hydrophilic chemicals that don't like fat, they said are generally less toxic. But that's not true. The reality is when you combine chemicals that, that like water with chemicals that like fat, the fat enables the water chemicals to actually get into the body and cause adverse health effects. So everything we know about toxicology, about looking at exposure standards, is actually redundant because the chemical mixtures, when you add one chemical that is not a carcinogen with another chemical that is not a carcinogen, those additive effects, those synergistic effects could be a hundredfold and they can be carcinogenic together. And the reality is when you look at your shampoo, you've got 30 ingredients. Your conditioner, another 20 ingredients. When you look at dry cleaning solvents, you've got many ingredients. Cleaning products, I don't even have to label them. Fragrance, 400 ingredients that because of trade secrecy laws, they don't even have to tell you what they are. Many of them are phthalates and hormone disrupting chemicals and skin and lung irritants. So the synergistic effect, the way we regulate chemicals is completely ineffective. And that's why we have to rely on waiting till the disease occurs in the human population before we look back and go, what the heck happened? So when we look at exposure standards, in many ways what we're going to do in this subject is actually not so relevant when it comes to the domestic <coughs> situation. Because if you, when you do air sampling, you're going, wow, that level is acceptable in the Safe Work Australia's guidelines. But they are reacting and they are sick. Most of your PIDs, photoionisation detectors to pick up chemicals, uh, will probably be acceptable in the Australian Safe Work Australia website, in their guidelines. But they're still sick and you know they're chemically sensitive. Because it does, it, those guidelines are based on this chemical, this rat. But the reality is paint contains multiple amount of synergistic chemicals whose impact is essentially unknown on a certain genotype. So when it comes to VCAT and court of law, this is what will be followed. The reality of the work that we do is that this isn't sensitive enough to, it doesn't take into consideration why people react to chemicals the way they do. So finishing off the 10 toxic truths, chemical cocktails are synergistic. A mix of chemicals together has different effect than single substances. So one chemical to a rat causes some symptoms, but if you add another chemical to it, its impact can be completely different. If it's hydrophilic, its impact by itself will be minimal in the body. But when you add it to another chemical that's lipophilic, it will drive it into organs that it would never have accessed if it was on its own. But when they test chemicals, they're only using that major active ingredient. They don't test the synergistic effect of all of that, all the chemicals in that shampoo on a group of rats. It's not the way it's done. So when you look at exposure standards, it's based on safety data sheets, which is one chemical, one rat. This is not appropriate because we are exposed to multiple chemicals which in itself can have synergistic effect where one plus one equals a thousand or a million in terms of its adverse health effects. The next one, tiny doses can cause a big effect. I've already talked about that, hormone disrupting chemicals. So hormone disrupting chemicals can have massive impact on children and an unborn fetus. And the World Health Organization and the National Academies Press are going in their reports, we don't know what to do, how do you regulate these chemicals? And that's the current scientific, where we're at science, in terms of science. They don't know what to do. Sort of a bit like the horse has already bolted. Next one, windows of development are critical. I've already referred to that. That if you give a chemical at a certain time of development, its impact can have devastating consequences. Um, windows of development are critical. So thalidomide was a great example. Didn't affect mum, but
but affected, of course, the unborn fetus and you know limb buds and lacking limbs, etc. DES, diethylstilbestrol, given to women for pregnancy, it caused dramatic impact on the, the daughters and even in their sons on their reproductive life. The next one is biomagnification occurs up the food chain. This is where Rachel Carson's work, looking at why do the top predators are affected by, why is their reproductive uh, life affected in top predators, i.e. eagles, alligators, people, animals at the end of the food chain. And what they found was that when you have, for example, pesticides coming into, in the drift, getting into the water supply, and they tested that water, they didn't find many chemicals, even though they knew they put two tonnes of pesticides in that water supply, they couldn't find it. Why? The plankton absorbed the pesticides. Now, what ate the plankton? Yeah, the little fish ate the plankton, and then the big fish ate the little fish, and they ate a lot of little fish, and then the birds and the eagles, etc., ate the big fish. So by the time you went from the plankton to the eagle, the biomagnification was 10 million times. It's a global problem. It is not, we need to look at this on such a global scale, on our farming practices, on our waste management, on our, you know, in, on every level, because the contamination is occurring in such a degree, not just in wildlife, which is where it started, but of course in our own human bodies. So what we see is all these stats on asthma, you know, one in four kids with asthma in Australia, um, ADHD has increased 400%, neurodevelopmental disorders, you know, as I said, with autism has increased dramatically in that time. Breast cancer has more than doubled, testicular cancer has increased 400%, genital malformations in young boys, baby boys, has increased fourfold in Australia in 20 years. Why? Hormone disrupting chemicals. When you have synthetic oestrogen hormones, because that mother's wearing perfume during her pregnancy, getting into an unborn male fetus, <coughs> at a critical window of development, you shut down and reduce <coughs> testosterone production. If you reduce testosterone production in an unborn fetus, is it any wonder they get hyperspadius or uh, undescended testicles and cryptorchidism, which is undescended testicles, or where at the end of the penis where the hole should be is somewhere else. That has increased fourfold in Australia in the last 30 years, genital malformations in young boys. And they're directly relating these to synthetic estrogen hormones in the environment, in our food in our air, in our perfume, in our flame retardants. So this is why it becomes so critical to develop <coughs> strategies, A, to educate people, and secondly, show them how simply, by addressing the dust in their home and being mindful about what they buy, that's not loaded with these chemicals in the first place, is something that will not adversely affect their health. Mm -hmm.